Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture. We are a non-profit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This presentation and many others are available through our online library at instituteofcatholicculture.org and on our ICC app. Whether you are looking for weekly Bible studies, in-depth courses, or talks related to the faith, you will find it at the ICC. Please check out our upcoming schedule of live online events and engage with us on social media. All are welcome to join our growing international ICC family. For handouts, links, and further study materials, please visit this program's page on our website or wrap. Blessed is our God at all times, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. O God of all spirits and of all flesh, who have destroyed death and overcome the devil and given life to the world, grant, O Lord, to the soul of your servant William, who has departed from this life, that he may rest in a place of light, in a place of happiness, in a place of peace, where there is no pain, no grief, no sign. And since you are a gracious God and the lover of mankind, forgive him every sin he has committed by thought, word, or deed. For there is not a man who lives and does not sin. You alone are without sin. Your righteousness is everlasting and your word is true. You are the resurrection and the life and the repose of your departed servant, William, O Christ our God. And we render glory to you, together with your eternal Father and your all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages and ages. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we have a, uh, a, a wonderful uh, subject in front of us, and related so much to what my brother was just speaking about. And especially as you come to the end, I think you're going to really see as we come to the end of our lecture tonight, uh, how it really pulls everything together that we're, we're focusing on here, not only in the ICC in general, but also for this particular topic and specifically what my brother was talking about there in the pregame, as he likes to call it. So last week, we looked at the uh, great women in the early stages of ancient Israel. We looked at Sarah, we looked at Rebecca, we looked at Miriam. There were lots of others we could have looked at, of course. I, uh, I, I would love to someday maybe do a whole study on this, women in the Bible, starting with Eve, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. But, uh, but we, because of time, of course, we can only focus on uh, the, the essentials. And so we looked at Sarah and Rebecca and Miriam and saw in them, some beautiful examples of the virtue, the strength, the might of woman. And tonight, again, there are a number of names as I was preparing for this lecture this evening. There are so many different names in the Old Testament of wonderful women who did great things. And I think we listed some of them last time. I think Kelsey asked uh, for a list of some of them. We talked about uh, I, I listed for you that not only, of course, in the in the early stages do we have the story of Eve and Sarah, Rebecca, Leah, Rachel, Tamar, Jochebed, the mother of Moses. Each one of these, we could have an hour lecture on. Miriam, we ended with last time. We're going to begin here with Deborah and Jile, the um, in the story of the judges, but. We're not going to have time to cover everyone, and, and I, I would encourage you, if you are inspired by what we're doing here, to then jump into your Bible, open up your Bible, and look at some of these stories. So not only uh, tonight, we're going to look at Deborah and Jael, we're going to look at Ruth and Hannah, Hannah, a Hannah that you, uh, another Hannah that you're not uh, thinking of, of course, but we'll talk about that in a second, but, but there's also the story of Holda, the prophetess, during the time of Josiah the king. Her story is recorded in 2 Kings. Holda, the prophetess, a mighty woman of faith who was the primary kind of spiritual backer of Josiah, the great king who restored the monotheistic faith to Israel. 
So we know of Josiah, King Josiah, but what about Huldah? Huldah is the prophetess that's behind Josiah, like Isaiah was behind Hezekiah. So you know that you know King Hezekiah. You know how Isaiah was backing him and supporting him spiritually and encouraging him. Huldah is the Isaiah of Josiah in a certain sense. So go and read her little, it's a, just a short little narrative about her and what she did. So there's Huldah. We don't have time to look at her tonight. There's also the story of Judith and Esther. Judith, of course, brings with it all sorts of historical questions, which are way beyond something we can do in a, in a lecture tonight. But the basically, as you're reading the story of Judith, you have a wonderful story about a woman who does a really great thing. But, um, but there are historical question marks about that. The story in its origin and in its, and it's always been read, has always been understood to be a story that has to be using pseudonyms in a certain sense. The, there, there are code names and code words in the story that were probably intended in the story so that the book could be distributed and read by a people during a time of persecution. There are other passages like this in the Bible. In the book of Revelation, there's examples of this kind of thing where you're using, where pseudonyms are being used, kind of code words that are being used that would be understood by an audience that is the same mind of the author, but to someone outside that circle would be completely incomprehensible. So uh, maybe another time we could talk about the story of Judith and, and that histor those interesting historical elements. The story of Esther, right? The story of Esther, again, a wonderful story, and there are not as many historical details are of, of uh, conflict or uh, of, of problem, but, the, but there we have lots of manuscript complexities. And so what I thought we would focus in rather tonight is on those that are so easily discerned in salvation history uh, and, and what they did without all of those other complications. So Let's turn now to the story of Deborah and Jael in the book of Judges. So if you open up your Bibles, up into your, your first couple of books of your Bible, you, you pass the, the Torah, the, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. And then after that, you come to the story of Joshua and Judges. Okay, and then we're going to look at the story of Judges, a little historical context. What's a judge? We hear the word judge in English, and we think of, I don't know, Judge Judy or something, or who knows what people are thinking of. But the, a judge, we're not talking about someone sitting in a courtroom. The, the term judge is used to describe these individuals who had kind of a role similar to what we would call of a judge today, in the sense that they were discerning what was right and wrong for the people that came to them. In so many ways, you could call Moses a judge. And if you kind of look at salvation history in sections, the first of the judges, I would say, would be Moses, really. Moses and Joshua and Caleb, Miriam. And then we move into the book called the Book of the Judges. But if you look at the story of Moses to Joshua all the way into the book of Judges, we're really talking about one story. Each of these individuals, Moses, Joshua, Deborah, as we're going to see, Gideon, these individuals were used by the Lord as an instrument through which he would do things and speak things. So the judges really had, in a certain sense, a twofold job that we see bifurcating later on in salvation history. We have in the judge both a political ruler often and also a prophetic personality, a spiritual and political personality all kind of wrapped up in one. When we come to the close of the age of the judges, the last judge, and I'll bet our, our uh, hey, let's just let's do a quiz, Kelsey, we're for who was the last of the judges, as far as like a, 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 a big person now, the last judge to rule before we move into the next era? It's a little bit of a tricky question because there's not, you could, you could come with a couple different names, but hopefully one big shining light, one personality 
the end of the era of the judges before we move into the age of what we would call where that bifurcates into the kings and prophets. Who was that last great judge? Teresa. Samuel. Oh, Teresa, you know how to warm the cockles. Oh, Kelsey, send her a raise or something. Okay, something free, a gift. Okay, she just made my day. So Samuel, Samuel is this incredible individual that so many people know almost nothing about, but he's so critical in salvation history. So Samuel's the last of the judges in so many ways. You could call his sons judges in a certain sense, but they didn't do so well. But Samuel's the end of the judges, and he's really a hinge character. We talked about this in the Old Testament class. He's a hinge between the age of the judges or the period of the judges and the period of the kings and prophets. In fact, he functions in both ways. He's, he's the last of the judges in so many ways because he's the one that anoints the king. And once the king is now in power, Saul, and then eventually David, he takes on a role which is simply prophetic or spiritual. So it's an interesting little uh, kind of period in history there for the ancient Israel. So we're in the age of the judges here. These are individuals who ruled over God's people, directed them spiritually, and often even fought battles for them and led them into battle. Okay, so we're in the period of the judges here. This is is way before the time of Samuel. This is really early on. And we come to the story of Deborah, and this is in chapter 4, chapter 4 of the book of Judges. Chapter 4 of the book of Judges, there are many judges in ancient Israel. There's the mighty judges and the, the, the great judges, the, and then, or the major judges, the minor judges. It really just depends on how much material is related to them. And this is in Judges chapter 4, verse 4. Okay, actually, well, actually for context. So the, in the cycle of Judges, you know that the what's happening is the people of Israel are falling into polytheism. And then as they fall into polytheism, they're now separating themselves from their God. They're walking away from his protection. And so what they find is that they're now at their, they become cannon fodder for their enemies. Once they get tired of that, they say, oh, wait a minute. Didn't we have some God in the past who used to protect our ancestors? So they cry out to the God of Israel. They repent and he sends them a judge or a savior who can save them from their enemies. And the judge tells them, look, you get back and right with God and everything's going to go well. And then all of a sudden it's going well. They're defeating their enemies. Things, are, The crops are well, fruitful. Everything's okay. And then the judge dies eventually. And the people slip back into polytheism. And the whole thing starts over and over. This is called the cycle of the judges. You can read about that cycle in chapters one and two of the book of Judges. In the midst of that cycle here in chapter four, the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. So their judge died. Now they're slipping back into polytheism. As the Lord sold them into the hand of Jobin, the king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, the commander of the army of Sisera, who dwelt in this long worded place. Then the people of all Israel cried to the Lord for help, for he had 900 chairs of iron and oppressed the people of Israel cruelly for 20 years. Verse four. Now, Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth. So she's judging the people and she's even called a prophetess. You see that? So there, you can see how that judge had two roles. She's got a political role. People are coming to her with disputes about property and, and, and whatever, any kind of legal stuff. They come to her. She can discern, do this, don't do that. You're right, you're wrong. You pay him, whatever. And then, but she's also a prophetess. People knew that she also spoke the word of the Lord. She was judging Israel at that time. She used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. So this is just north of Judea. And the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh in Naphtali, and said to him, Yahweh, the God of Israel, commands you, go, gather your men at Mount Tabor, taking 10,000 from the tribe of Naphtali and the tribe of Zebulun. This is that region up there. And I will draw out Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to meet you by the river Kishon and his chariots and his troops, and I will give him into your hand. 
Barak said to her, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. I can understand that. Right. I mean, here you've got you've got the Moses of the time. Right. Deborah is the current Moses. She is the spiritual leader of the people. She, they know that when she speaks, God speaks from her mouth. And she says, go do these things. And he says, yeah, right. But remember, she's a judge, too. She's judging the people. She's got political, military discernment, too. So he's saying, hey, yeah, I'll go. But you got to go with me as the commander, basically. Right? I want you to just tell us what to do. I, I think we can understand. I mean, I th- a lot of times the poor guy gets you know, labeled as a chicken. But he, he's, I, I, I think if we were in his case, wouldn't you want Deborah along with you in the chariot? Okay. Then Deborah rose. Uh, I'm sorry, let's see, verse nine. Barak said to her, If you go, uh, verse nine, and she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the road on which you are going will not lead to your glory, for the Lord will sell sister into the hand of a woman. So he gets a little bit of a jab there of, Hey, go do what I told you to do. She told him, she, She's the prophetess. She gives the word of the Lord, go do it. Right. So he's, so a little lack of courage there. He wants to have mom along with him. Right. So, so he, lack of courage is going to end in the glory of the victory being in the hand of a woman, not the hand of the, of Barak. Then Deborah rose and went with Barak to Kadesh and Barak summoned Zebulun, Naphtali to Kadesh and 10,000 men with up went the heel and Deborah went up with them. Now, Heber the Kenite had separated from the Kenites and descended the descendant of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far away as the oak of Zanain, where which is near Kadesh, when, when Sisera told that Barak, the son of Benum, had gone up to Mount Timor, Sisera called out all of his chariots, 900 chariots of iron, all the men were with him, and, and of course, the battle ensues. Now, the battle, of course, turns, of course, quickly to the Israelites. Verse 17, Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael. So the Israelites are victorious in the battle. The battle's turning, and the Israelites are chasing the enemy. The enemy's fleeing, and, the, and, and Sisera himself is fleeing, of course. This is verse 17. He fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was, a, 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 there was peace between Job and the king of Hazor and the house of Heber, the Kenite, and Jael came out to meet Sisera and said to him, turn aside, my lord, turn aside to me, have no fear. So he turned aside to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug, a sheet. And he said to her, pray, give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. For us, a skin of milk, what? We're everything like, you know, jugs from the grocery store. But these are goat and sheep herders, right? This is their, this is one of the main things they would drink and also one of the things they would, they would consume for, for sustenance. So a little bit of milk, this is what she would have handy. She opened a skin of milk and gave him a drink and covered him. And, and he said to her, stand at the door of the tent. And if any man comes and asks you, is there one here? Say no. Joel, the wife of Heber took a t- tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and drove the peg into his temple. Every time I read that, I feel a migraine coming. Can you imagine the pain of that? Till it went down into the ground. So she pounds the thing completely through his head. What a woman. I, I think Kelsey was amazed. I was calling Rebecca. The what were they called? Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is the Shira. Okay. This is the Shira of the Old Testament. Okay. She drove it into the ground as he was lying fast asleep from weariness. So he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael went out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you are seeking. So he went into her tent, and there lay Sisera dead with a tent peg in his temple. So on that day, God subdued Job and the king of Canaan before the people of Israel, and the hand of the people of Israel bore harder and harder on Job and the king of Canaan until they destroyed Job, the king of Canaan. And you have this beautiful song here of Deborah and Barak 
We don't need to read the whole thing. We don't have time to do it, but you get a little summary of it in chapter five. This is in chapter five, verse 24, kind of a highlight of the song. Chapter five, verse 24. Most blessed of women be Jile, the wife of Heber the Kenite, of tent-dwelling women, most blessed. He asked water, and she gave him milk. She brought him curds in a lordly bowl. She put her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the working man, men's mallet. She struck Sisera a blow. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple. He sank, he fell. He lay still at her feet. At her feet, he sank, he fell. Where he sank, there he fell dead. We could continue reading, but I think you got the picture. Okay, so, so there we have the story of, of, of a mighty woman, actually two mighty women. It's a two for one deal on this one. We get Deborah, who is a, who advises politically. She's got political insight, obviously a grace of God. And she also speaks the word of the Lord, Deborah one of the greatest of the judges in the whole book of Judges. And then along with her is her companion, in a certain sense, not Barak, but rather Jael, who receives the victory. Imagine the courage of Jael here. Think about this. Think of the different the, the circumstances that could have happened. Think of her options Think of, and remember her family was in peace with this other man's family. So she has to make a decision at this point. What is the right thing to do? She could have preserved him alive. She could have hid him. She could have been famous in the enemy's camp for having saved the general so that he'd come back and attack next spring. But no, she decides to become the victor in the battle and remove this enemy from Israel. And so we find also uh, in these stories, we find a number of these women who normally we associate, I think we, we talked about this last week, physical strength with man. Physical strength is a, a pure character of man. It, there's no debate about this. I'm sorry, women, if you're really strong. It, it, look, there, men have a physical strength in their bodies that is just not there in women. I can't tell you how many times, and I'm not very muscular or strong. I can't tell you how many times my wife has brought to me a jar or something said, can you open this? And I just turn it. And it always reinforced my mind when I do that, she hands me some jar that she, and she's a pretty strong woman. And I, I just turn it and open it. And I, I'm always amazed at how easy it is to open and how she couldn't. Right, so there's there's clearly an, ins an incredible amount of strength in the male body, and I know there's you know shiras out there and muscle builders and stuff, but in general, men have a physical strength that women also typically don't have, as far as just brute strength. Okay, now listen, my wife gave birth to seven children. Okay, and I saw strength there that I I'll never have. Okay, there's another kind of strength there. That's the endurance strength. That's another one. Okay, we'll talk about another time. But, but uh, that brute strength of just of force, uh, of opening that jar or whatever it may be, we usually associate that with man, and rightly so, and also man's single mindedness, focusing on the job ahead. Those wives that are listening understand both of these things, right? But the woman often, in her virtue, she has other strengths. She has her a body that can bear children, that is just absolutely beyond the mind of man as far as a persistence. When labor goes on, five, six hours, men, we wouldn't, we would be just, we would give up, okay? But, but they have this persistence, this persistence in that bodily strength, this endurance, which is the endurance that is, enables them to be a source of life. So their bodies are these incredible sources of life and we all know that, right? How many times you run as a kid back in the embrace of mom, right? Back to that, to that embrace of the source of life for you. And then woman's mind, different from the man, it's typically the multitasker, right? Thinking of all the different options, possibilities. And these two things, man and woman, strength, physical, bodily strength, and the way their minds work, work in perfect 
completion with an E. Perfect completion, right? Perfect compliments. Okay, so, but we also do find on occasion in these stories, think of, of example here, this story of Gile, who is able to overpower this man, obviously using her mind, right? She knows she can't wrestle him to the ground or take him out in a sword fight. So what does she do? Multitasker, figures out all the options. How can I overpower him physically? She waits, gives him some milk, puts him down for a little nap, and then takes him out. You can see this also in the story of, of Judith, right? Again, Judith waits. She knows she can't overpower the general. There's no way. Physically, he's a general. He's a, he's a master sword fighter. He, he is, he's the greatest of the soldiers of the entire army. There's no way she can take him out physically in, in a hand-to-hand in a -hand battle. Forget it. But she's able to outsmart him, the multitasker, right? She's thinking about these different options. She watches him get drunk. She waits till he's, he's asleep in his drunkenness and then takes his own sword quietly and with two whacks, takes off his head, right? So she, again, knowing uh, that's the multitasker, right? So, But we do find these women using their bodies in sometimes in ways we wouldn't expect, right? To overpower these evil men. Okay, so now we're going to move now to two other stories uh, that are a little, uh, well, next one is certainly way less violent. And then the final one gets into violence, but in another way. So let's turn to the story of Ruth now, the story of Ruth. So if you turn to your Bibles over a couple more pages, you come to the end of the book of Judges, the end of the book of Judges, just before 1 Samuel, and you come to the little story of Ruth. This is one of my most favorite books, the entire Bible, because I have a memory of it. Well, it's many reasons, but in for our Hebrew exam at Catholic University, our first Hebrew exam, as far as like reading text and being examined on the text, we were given the book of Ruth, but we were, and, and we had to just read it on our own and be prepared for the exam. And I was so paranoid about the exam. I remember I read it and reread it and reread it. I must have read the book of Ruth in Hebrew probably a hundred times. I mean, it's every, every, I'd read it, I'd set it down and I'd go do something else for a little bit. I'd come back down and reread it and reread. In fact, I get to a point where I was reading it so fast that I started to hear certain poetic elements in it that I had not seen before because I could start to read it as if it was being heard fluently in Hebrew in a certain sense. And there were some beautiful things in there that, that uh, really amazed me from a, a, a literary uh, structure standpoint. But anyway, so the book, of Judge, uh, the book of Ruth here. So the story, the setting, we're in the time of the judges, the period of the judges. So it's not like it's the, judge, the book of judges over. So now the age of the judges is over. No, we're, this book is a little short story set in the time of the judges, in the period of the judges, just not in the book of judges. In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. Okay, now, th there's a lot of funny stuff here. Well, not funny, it's kind of sad, but some irony. So, in the days of the judges, so we got our historical context, when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Okay, famine. When do famines come? Typically when the people are not doing what they're supposed to do. So there's a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem. Now, Bethlehem means place or house of bread, house of food. Okay, so it, you, specifically you call it house of bread. But in general, what it basically means is location where there's food. Okay, so there's a famine in the place where there's food. Right, so it, in the Hebrew, it's there's a lot of irony in this all the way through. In Judah, in, in, in Judah, and went to the man went to sojourn in the country of Moab, and his wife and his two sons. Now, if you know salvation history, you know this is not going to go well, right? This and there was a time, there was a famine in the time of Abraham, and he went to sojourn in Egypt, right? So, uh oh, so you know there's going to be something wrong. Then the name, uh, the name of the man was Elimelech. Uh, so, uh, my God is King. And the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons were Mahlon and Hilion. They were Ephrodites. They were from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she 
was left with her two sons. These two, so again, right? If you're reading this, you're a, you're a Jew hearing the story right off the bat. <laughs> that's right. Uh, you got what's coming to you. That's what, of course, that's what's going to happen. Okay, so then these two took the sons took Moabite wives. Oh no! Yeah, and the name of the one was Orpha, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they lived about 10 years, and then they died. Oh, well, that's what happens when you take Moabite wives, okay? You go to the land of Moab, you're going to die. And your sons take Moabites, they're going to die, okay? So if you're reading this from a Jewish standpoint, you're hearing this, this is just totally predictable, okay? And so that the woman was bereft of two sons and her husband. That's what happens when you go to the foreign land. There's your message. Don't go to Egypt, nor Moab. Then she started with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. You see that? Right? So she learned she's in the land of Moab, outside of the land of, of, of the people of God, and she hears that God visited his people in their land and gave them food, right? So it's time to go back to Bethlehem, place of food. There, there's a basic story here, which you find all throughout salvation history is wait on the Lord, Right? And so Abraham should not go down to Egypt, wait on the Lord. So, so she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go, return each of you to her mother's house. May Yahweh deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Yahweh grant that you may find a home, each of you in the house of her husband. Right, somehow you'll you'll get married again, and things will go well. Thank God, you know. Hope. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, "We will return with you to your people." But Naomi said, "Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband." If I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me. For your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept. And again, Orpha kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpha takes off. By the way, I don't know. Our Hebrew professor told us that Oprah Winfrey's name comes from this, but somehow it got messed up in the hospital or something. So I know with Oprah and some Orpha, but I don't know. Okay, so verse 15, and she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her husband, her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Right? Go, go, go back to your people, right? But Ruth said, and this is really, in so many ways, the most beautiful part of the whole book. And in Hebrew, this is just glorious. She said, entreat me not to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May Yahweh do, so she takes the name of the Hebrew God. You see this? So she's a convert. May Yahweh, and that's why I'm using the word not, yeah, you see it in all caps there, right? I'm, I'm using that name here to make sure you guys are following, tracking with the theology of what's happening there. May Yahweh do so to me and more. That's a, a Hebrew, it's a, it's, it's apocopated, but it's a Hebrew oath form that basically saying, may God kill me if I don't do what I should do, right? So may God do to me and more. If, e if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, no more. So they returned to Bethlehem, okay? And so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the, wo and the women of the town said, is this Naomi? Is this Naomi? So Naomi means pleasant, basically. Pleasantness, okay? Is this Naomi? Is this pleasant? Pleasantness? Is this Miss Pleasant? She said to her, do not call me Miss Pleasant. Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me Miss Bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly 
with me. I went away full, and Yahweh has brought me back empty. Why call me Miss Pleasant when Yahweh has afflicted me with the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Miss Pleasant returned. And Ruth, the Moabites, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Okay, so it's that's, that's really rich there, right? The barley harvest, that's springtime. That's late spring. They're just starting the barley harvest. This is the beginning of the, the, the plentitude of the Lord for them, right? Of all, this is the, the, the grain harvest has two parts to it. We've talked about this in the Old Testament class. The first part of it is the barley harvest. Second part, the wheat harvest. So they start with the barley. That's Passover. The beginning of the barley harvest, Passover. And then when you get to the end of the wheat harvest, one just flows right in the next, you're, in, you're at the end of the total grain harvest or the bread or the food harvest. And now you have all your grain, your barns, and they celebrate what's called the second great feast, called the Feast of Sheaves or Weeks, or also known in Greek as Pentecost to Ema, the 50th day, right? Pentecost. So this is the, the two, those two feasts that kind of frame the grain harvest for ancient Israel. The last one is Oktoberfest, right? That or this is the um, Feast of Booze or Tabernacles. Okay, so the barley harvest. So the author's really making sure you're paying attention here. This is, it's, imagine this. It's, so Israel is, is high desert uh, in this region. Uh, so you're going to have rolling brown hills that have, are now beautifully. The, and if anyone lives in California, you know this, what this looks like. You have rolling brown hills all year round. But when the rain comes, it's happening right now. Those rolling brown hills suddenly look like the, the hills of Ireland. All of California looks like Ireland for a couple of months. And then it all turns brown again. Okay, so this is really similar to the climate of, of that region, Israel, where everything's dry and brown. And all of a sudden now you have all the barley and wheat is growing. And you now are going to harvest that. And you're going to be able to take that into your barns and all of that. Okay, so this is just try to, to begin the barley harvest. You should be thinking of, Rolling brown hills that are now look like the hills of Ireland, covered with barley and wheat swaying in the wind. Okay. And then so now the rest of the story, we don't have time to read the whole thing. I'm going to summarize for you in chapters two and three what happens, and then we'll conclude. And that is that the uh, eventually Ruth goes out to glean among the harvesters. The harvesters are out there whacking down the barley, right, with their sickles and gathering the sheaves and st stacking them in the field. But there is a law in ancient Israel, and you can write this down if you like, in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 4. In Leviticus 19, verse 4, and there are parallel passages in Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and I'm trying to look at them all, where the law, God says, look, when you glean your fields, when you harvest your fields, do not harvest everything. Do not harvest all the way to the borders nor try to get every last fruit or barley or whatever it is. The law in Leviticus says this, when you harvest your grapes, for example, any grapes that fall to the ground, leave them. Don't pick them up. Do not harvest all the way to the edge. When you're harvesting your barley and your wheat, you go and you harvest, you, you, the sickle goes, and the sickle guy, as he's, as he's throwing his sickle into it, he gathers his, his sheave, but anything that falls to the ground is not to be picked up. Leave it on the ground. And do not harvest all the way to the edges. Why? The book of Leviticus says, in two places, also the book of Deuteronomy, let that be for the poor and the sojourner among you. Let the poor and the sojourner among you, who would also be poor, go into the field after you and pick up the stuff and whatever extra is left over. Okay, so that's the, the context here. So they're out there harvesting, of course, and anything that's falling to the ground, they're leaving it. And But she, Ruth, is coming along, a poor foreigner, sojourner, right, is coming along and gathering up the stuff. And that's, that's considered legal by the law. You can do that. Pick up the, the, the stuff that the, the, the harvesters leave. But then when Boaz sees what's going on, he says, hey, who's that lady out there following you guys? Oh, that's Ruth, the Moabite girl. Remember, you know, the story, her husband died, the horrible, oh, yeah. 
So he goes over to her and says, hey, 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 come here, come here. Listen, don't follow behind the harvesters. Gather with the harvesters. And then so she ends up taking home a huge amount of grain. And Naomi finds out, so, well, where did you harvest? Where did you glean today? Normally you come home with like a, you know, a little bag. She comes home with a massive amount of grain. And Naomi says, where did, what happened? And so Ruth tells the story. There was this man, he was very nice to me and he let me go in with the harvester so I could harvest the grain as well. Oh, wow. What was his name? Oh, that, he's a, he's a relative, Ruth. Um, you go there next tomorrow as well. So she goes back and you know the story. Eventually, Ruth and Naomi are figuring out that, hey, maybe Boaz will not only be the provider for them from a, a materialistic standpoint, but also to provide a son. And so she requests, Ruth requests at Naomi's direction that he be next of kin. That is the leverate law, right? That the normally the brother-in-law right? That is the brother of the dead man has relations with the wife, the widow, so that she can bring forth a son. And then that son is considered to be the son of the dead man. That way his inheritance is preserved in ancient Israel. If she bears any children after that by the brother-in-law, they're considered his. But the first son that's born of that marriage is considered to be the son of the dead brother. And he and that son inherits the land of his dead father. Okay, so there's a way to preserve the inheritance. So then what happens? Of course, she Boaz sees the, the 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 not only the piety of Naomi and Ruth, but but that also their devotion to this dead man. Ruth did not have to come with Naomi. Ruth did not have to do any of the things she was doing. In fact, Boaz says to her, you could have gone after some wealthy young man. But here you have tried to preserve the, the inheritance of your dead husband. What a beautiful thing. And so, so Boaz takes her in marriage and raises up a son for the dead man. And of course, this becomes the genealogy of David. So this is in the, and you read the end of the story here, it, it tells you about, um, this is in chapter 3, verse 13, it tells you about the, the um, how she becomes part of the genealogy of David, right? And in the end, that's actually the purpose of the whole story. There's a lot of other catechetical devices going on, but this is to tell you about the background, the genealogy of David. The book itself, most scholars would suggest, was probably composed around the time of David when he was king, because people were wondering, who is this guy? What's his background, right? What's his family like, you know? So, so we have Boaz and Ruth, and from that marriage, we end up with Obed, servant, and then Obed becomes the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David. You know this genealogy from Matthew chapter one as well. Okay, beautiful story. Beautiful story. Uh, but what I wanted to just, I want to look at that because we think of again these women, these heroines of the Old Testament. We might be thinking of blood and swords and stuff like Judith and, and Esther. And, uh, and, or, and, well, Esther doesn't use a sword, but uses the own guy's gibbet to hang him on. But, the, but someone like, like uh, Gile, but there's also, we find these heroines, these heroines of faith, not only physical strength, but, but a, a, a strength of spirit. And so we have the story, like I said, of Deborah and Jael. We have the story of Ruth. Ruth, in so many ways, is showing this incredible virtue we talked about in the story of Rebecca. And that is this love or devotion, dedication to her husband, his family, and his God. She completely, Ruth completely submits to her husband, his family, and his God, and even after her husband was dead. And this is, uh, Rebecca's virtue in this regard was impressive, but I, I think Ruth takes it to a whole, a whole other level. All right, so now uh, let's turn to the story of Hannah, and we'll close with that 
Again, we can look at Judith, we can look at Esther. I encourage you to read those stories. And I think in Swords and Spirits, Kelsey, I think my brother covered a little bit of those stories as well. So maybe you could link that for the for the participants. But we're going to now jump forward. There's the story I already mentioned and described to you briefly about the story of Judith. There's also the story of Esther we could look at. Each one of these would take us a fair amount of time. But I thought it'd be helpful to look at a very short little story of an incredible woman that I think in so many ways summarizes everything we've been talking about in this series. We'll prepare us for our study of women in the New Testament, and I think will also help us in this current situation that we find ourselves in culturally and politically today. So let's turn to 2 Maccabees, the mother of the seven sons. This is in 2 Maccabees. Her name, is, her name is not given in the book by tradition, by the Jewish tradition. Uh, her name is Hannah. Hannah, a common name in Hebrew. The, you know of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. In Hebrew, the word chen is means gift. It's the equivalent of the word grace. So Hannah is that feminine form. Hannah means lady grace, for lack of a better term. We talked about this in our our Old Testament study. Lady Grace, very important image of of the Most Holy Theotokos in the New Testament. More on that another time. Okay, so in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, 2 Maccabees, it's an easy one to remember because there's seven sons, the seven Maccabees in chapter 7. It worked out well. So in 2 Maccabees chapter 7, historical context, what's going on? The people of Israel have returned from Babylon. They are in their land again. They've rebuilt the temple. They've rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. Things are going fairly well for them. The, but then the Greeks conquer the Persians. The Persians, the Medo-Persian Empire, remember, had allowed them to return, Cyrus. So under the Medo-Persians, they were allowed to return and rebuild their temple, rebuild their walls. But then the Persians were conquered by Alexander the Great, the Greeks. And then after Alexander the Great died, then his, his empire was divided into under the control of his generals. And this particular region was under the control of a descendant of one of those generals, the founder of the city of Antioch. This descendant here now is called Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes decides to attack Israel. A lot of other things he did attacked Egypt and other things. This is, if you want kind of the historical layout of what was going on with the dates and everything, you want to read 1 Maccabees chapters 1 and 2. 1 Maccabees chapters 1 and 2 kind of lay the whole thing out for you. In 2 Maccabees, we tend to get, we get a lot of the historical details, but 2 Maccabees is more interested in in telling the, the kind of the colorful stories that went along with these dry historical events. First Maccabees is fairly dry. There's some great stuff in there, but it's fairly dry. Second Maccabees is, is the, in, in so many ways, the opposite of that, in that it, it, it doesn't focus on the historical details as much, but rather on the, the colorful examples of the faith of the Jews and the atrocities that came against them with, again, a lot of details. And this is a classic example of Second Maccabees chapter 7. In chapter 7, we hear about a persecution upon the Jews. Dating-wise, this is sometime in the 160s BC. So 167, 169, 167, Antiochus Epiphanes is attacking Jerusalem. So somewhere after 167, maybe in 165, somewhere in there, this story occurs. When Antiochus Epiphanes is is attacking systematically the Jews who refuse to give up their faith. This is in chapter 7. It happened also that seven brothers and their mother were arrested and were being compelled by the king under torture with whips and cords to partake of the unlawful swine's flesh. One of them, acting as their spokesman, said, What do you intend to ask and learn from us? For we are ready to die rather than transgress the laws of our fathers. The king fell into a rage and gave orders that pans and cauldrons be heated. These were heated immediately, and he commanded that the tongue of their spokesman, this eldest brother, 
be cut out and that they scalp him and cut off his hands and his feet while the rest of the brothers and the mother looked on. When he was utterly helpless, the king ordered him to be take, to take him into the fire, still breathing, and to fry him in a pan. And the smoke from the pan spread widely, but the brothers and their mother encouraged one another to die nobly, saying, the Lord, the God, is watchful, watching over us, and in truth has compassion on us, as Moses declared in his song, which bore witness against the people to their faces when he said, and he will have compassion on his servants. After the first brother, the second. And so as we read the story, one after another, the eldest brother, then the next eldest, then the next eldest, all the way down. And each one is bearing it with more courage. They just walk up and they offer their hands, their feet. One sticks his tongue out and says, go ahead, cut it off. And each one of them refers to the resurrection that's coming. They say, look, you can kill us, but the God of our people will raise us from the dead. And you can see this and look at this verse nine. When he was at his last breath, he said, you accursed wretch, you dismiss us from this present life but the king of the universe will raise us up to an everlasting renewal of life because we have died for his laws. You get this again in verse 13, when the next one is being killed, he says this in uh, verse 14, when he was near death, he said, verse 14, one cannot but choose to die at the hands of men and to cherish the hope, the hope that God gives of being raised again by him. But for you, there will be no resurrection to life right? They're going to have a resurrection and a judgment, as Jesus says in John 5. Okay, so then it goes on and on. In verse 20 now, we come to the end of the story in which the mother herself is now, comes on the scene in the narrative with her last son, her little boy. And it says, the mother was especially admirable and worthy of honorable memory. Though she saw her seven sons perish within a single day, she bore it with good courage because of her hope in the Lord. She encouraged each of them in the language of their fathers, filled with a noble spirit. She fired her, her, her woman's reasoning with a man's courage and said to them, I do not know how you came to being in my womb. It was not I who gave you life and breath, nor I who set and ordered the elements within each of you. Therefore, the creator of the world, who shaped the beginning of man and devised the origin of all things, will in his mercy give life and breath back to you again, since you now forget yourselves for the sake of his laws. Antiochus felt that he was being treated with contempt, and he was suspicious of her reproachfulness and her tone, the youngest brother being still alive. Antiochus, and we have a little summary here, tries to encourage the little boy. Look, kid, all your brothers are dead. I'll give you gold. I'll give you silver. I'll give you whatever you want. If you simply eat a piece of bacon, that's it. Just one little piece of bacon. And then look what the mother says. This is in verse 27. The mother leans over into his ear. This is verse 27. And says, as Andrews is, is, is tempting him with everything, right? She leans over close to him and she spoke in their native tongue in Hebrew and, and follows deriding the cruel and said, my son, have pity on me. I carried you nine months in my womb and nursed you for three years, and I have reared you and brought you up to this point in your life and have taken care of you. I beseech you, my child, to look at the heaven and the earth and see everything that is in them and recognize that God did not make them out of things that existed. Thus also mankind comes into being. Do not fear this butcher, but prove worthy of your brothers. Accept death so that in God's mercy, I may get you back again with your brothers. I cannot think of a greater heroine in the Old Testament than that woman. She epitomizes everything we would hope for, right? Here she has given these children birth, but she's also assisting them. She's in a certain sense, the, the, she's the, the helper of their birth into eternity so that they might have eternal life and rise from the dead. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into age of ages. Amen.
Thank you so much, Father Sebastian. All right, so let me turn to some questions. So first question came in through throughout the lecture, and this question is from Lauren, and it's going back to Deborah. And Lauren is asking, how did Deborah become a prophetess? Was there some sort of um, process, or did people just recognize that she was speaking the truth? So, Kelsey, uh, there's a problem in that uh, there's one other rule you forgot, and that was they can't ask difficult questions. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I don't know. I mean, it's got to be a question I know the answer to. It's helpful. So, no. So I don't know. That's a great question. How do these people arise as judges? There's no election process, as far as we can discern. When we look at the rise of Moses, Joshua, and then the judges after them, Gideon, Samson, the rest of them. Uh, Deborah, that it seems to be some sort of a calling from the Lord and maybe just kind of a recognition from the people that, hey, this person is, hey, we have people like that in our lives, right? Wise men or wise women that we go to, uh, that we know that can help direct us. You know, we have a, a question or an issue. We know that the Lord, they're, 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 the Lord speaks through them to us and we go to them, a spiritual advisor kind of thing. So, I would guess that it's probably a, a, a fairly organic process, mm -hmm. but we don't have any other information on that. Okay, nice. As a follow-up question, a few others were, were writing in about Deborah particularly and wondering um, how she came to have this position, specifically because some are under the impression that women were held maybe in a second class during those times. Can you speak to how women were regarded at that time and, and whether it was so strange for Deborah to be in this position? Sure. Yeah. So we, we often have these caricatures of the era of the Bible or of especially the Old Testament, right? There's, there's funny caricatures you hear all the time. Back then, God was really mean. Uh, you know, I was back to father. He's very difficult. Fathers are difficult. And then, you know, the New Testament is that's the era when the son comes in. He's much nicer. He's like, you know, your, your neighborhood friend. And then, um, and then when he's done with his job, then the spirit comes in and the spirit's just easy going, you know? Uh, so that's, of course, that's all heresy, but that's a lot of times what people think. And those same kind of caricatures and generalizations you get then with the, um, with the, the culture and the people at the time. So when we look at the women in the Old Testament, while it is true that they have a patriarchal society— that is that the father is is the the final word in the family that there's there is a hierarchy uh that we find that that women are uh have a fair amount of say and influence in the society as you would hope and expect uh and so when we read through the old testament i mean we just looked at some examples but it would be great to do a whole study just on women in their political power in, in the Old Testament. There are queens in the Old Testament who rule solely. There are um, women who have a lot of influence, wives and daughters and things like that in salvation history. And so I, I think today we have often a caricature of, of the Old Testament as a patriarchal society, which, which brings with that, that term in our modern culture means something wrong, right? Oh, patriarchal. Oh, that means oppressive. Oh, that means something's wrong. Well, yeah, men can be oppressive. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that, that's true. But that doesn't mean that the system itself is an error. It means that the characters in the system might be an error, right? So, um, so when we look at someone like Deborah, uh, think of Mary and the prophetess. In fact, whenever I teach a course on prophets, I always focus in on Mary and the prophetess. In the book of Exodus, we talked about last week, and then Huldah, the prophetess, during the time of Josiah, the way I mentioned this week, and uh, and the, so people often think of prophets. We, well, yes, the the majority of the the known prophets were men. There were also some extremely important prophetesses, and so while we have we know of the judges who were often or most of the men as that we know of, there were also female judges, and we know one of them, the name Deborah. So I think maybe what's going on here often when we, if that's shocking, for me, Deborah is not shocking. 
but but I've also read the Old Testament a thousand times. So for me, Deborah is not shocking. She's part of the fabric of the story. She's she's a Rebecca. She's a Sarah. She's a Miriam. She's a Holda. She's she's one of the characters. And just like in the New Testament, when we get in the New Testament, eventually, and we look at these women, we're going to see that there are women who are have an incredible amount of influence in the story and the life of Jesus. Jesus said to Mary Magdalene, you go tell the apostles I'm risen from the dead. Woman was the first one to announce the resurrection. That's incredible. And the story of Mary Magdalene goes on. We're going to talk about her. She's an amazing character. Talk about a heroine. So, uh, but I think often, again, we could come to the Bible and we come to it with a lot of baggage that we've we're we're carrying because we we that people have thrown it upon upon us. The Bible tells about a patriarchal society it means bad, right? The Bible tells us about women and how they were oppressed. And there are so many stories I could go into that show you so many ways in which women were protected. Actually, in the Torah, the law on divorce in the Old Testament is actually a law that protects the wife. The law of adultery is actually a law that protects an innocent wife. The, uh, we, I could go on. I mean, there's, there's so many places in which people often will look at these stories and say, oh, look at how oppressed the women were. If you look at it very carefully and read it, you read it thoroughly in context, you realize that what's happening is in ancient Israel, among the pagan nations, woman's role is actually being accentuated and highlighted. Awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, Sharon, you can go ahead with your question. Oh, okay. Um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to connect some dots in uh, four um, about the, the um, Mount Tabor reference um, and how that was in um, Judges 4, 12. Um, what's the significance? Uh, because I was thinking the transfiguration. So how does that connect maybe? Why is Mount Tabor in there? That's a great question. Okay. So Mount, uh, okay, so the mountain, it is the same mountain as the Transfiguration, but the story we're reading has nothing to do with the Transfiguration. I mean, you could say in a certain sense, typologically, God's salvation of his people happened at that spot, and Jesus appeared transfiguring the mountain. But there is no relationship in the story of the Transfiguration as appears in the New Testament with this story, aside from the fact that the word Tabor appears, and it's the same location, Okay. Now, why is it so, – but, but it's got to be connected, right? Okay, look, what if I were to say um, that George Washington, you know, rolled into the region that we now know as Washington, D.C., and or, – or let's say I told you that Joe Biden is president in Washington, D.C., and you were to say, like George Washington was there at one point. Okay, so no, I'm not telling you that for George. I, I have no, I want, I don't want, want you to associate George Washington with Joe Biden. But, but you might be like, oh yeah. But, okay, so that would be as, as extraneous as the connection is here. Now, why is that even pondered? Because we are, we are Christians who typically are ignorant of the Old Testament, and so when we hear about something like Mount Tabor. We immediately associate it with a story in the New Testament that we make a connection with, right? And and that's okay to make that connection, to say, look at that and say, well, is there a connection? That's a great question. But Mount Tabor appears all over the Old Testament. It's a now, why did they use that mountain? Well, I'll tell you, it's awesome for this. Okay, if you go to Mount Tabor, someday Kelsey's going to organize for us another ICC trip. And we're going to go there and you're going to stand on Mount Tabor with my brother and me. And we're going to stand there. You're going to see why the mountain was used for this purpose. It's in the plain of Jezreel. The plain of Jezreel is a big flat area in Galilee, Southern Galilee. And uh, today the Israelis use it for fish ponds and stuff. It's, just, it's all flat. They grew grain. There's a very flat area. And on the Eastern side of the valley, Mount Tabor rises out of nowhere. It's a conical mountain. It's a perfect cone coming right out of the ground. 
and it's perfectly flat all around it. It's very strange because normally, you know, you think of a mountain as part of a range. This was, I guess, probably a volcano or something where you have this perfectly flat area and this suddenly this perfectly conical mountain shoots up. And it's perfectly smooth. It's the kind of place where if you got chariots, you know, when you're in attack with chariots, you want your chariots uphill slightly because these, these things aren't made out of fiberglass. They're made out of iron. Okay. They're very heavy. And to get your speed up with your horses, you want to be slightly uphill. Chariot fights always started on a downhill slope. You always kept your chariots on the top of the hill. And then you come down the hill to the plain where you'd attack your enemy. And so, because you needed your momentum. In other words, the horse would be exhausted by the time, just to get the thing going, the horse would be exhausted within a few minutes. So the horse starts pulling and the chariot starts going by gravity down the hill. And so the, the conical shape of this mountain is perfect to hide chariots, you know, 15, 20 feet up the hill slightly under the trees and bushes and wait for the attack. And as soon as they, they give the signal, the chariots come flying down the hill and they can attack in the plain of Jezreel. So that's the reason why Mount Tabor was chosen, probably, not only geographically because of where the enemy was, but that would be a perfect spot for a, a chariot attack. Uh, and then the, um, and again, Mount Tabor appears all over the place in the, in the Bible, but we know it as the Mount Transfiguration, which is good. We think, okay, at least we know the Mount Transfiguration. St. Jerome said this. And I would really encourage you. This is why my brother designed this course this way. He wanted to have us to study the Old Testament heroines first and then the New Testament heroines. So you'd have context, right? St. Jerome said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. And when we hear the word scripture, we think of our Bible, right? right. We think of Jerome saying, ignorance of scripture is ignorant ignorance of your bible is ignorance of jesus that's what we're hearing the word scripture was being used by jerome in a way we don't use it today so often in the new testament the word scripture look it up it's used tons of times a number of times look at you take i don't know how many 50 60 times the word scripture appears it's always a reference to what you and i call the old testament and the early Christians continued to use the word that way. We would say today, maybe the scriptures of Israel, to be clear, or we'll say the Old Testament. They just said the word scriptures, which meant what you and I call the Old Testament. When, when St. Jerome was writing that, he wrote it in his prologue to his commentary on the book of Isaiah. Ignorance of Isaiah is ignorance of Christ. Ignorance of the Old Testament is ignorance of Christ. And that's why the ICC has done an incredible job at making sure the members of the ICC, the I, I heard my, my brother say this, the family, the ICC family is well-educated in the Old Testament. All right, Father, I think we'll end there tonight. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Could you conclude us in prayer? Absolutely. Glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this program from the Institute of Catholic Culture. Remember to download our app and share our online library with friends, co-workers, and family members. To learn more, get involved, and support the Institute's work, Visit instituteofcatholicculture.org and visit us on social media.